Good morning and welcome to the second session, uh, Microsoft Project for Engineers. So this is the second in our Essential Skills Insights series, very kindly powered by Flowgas. So I remember to, that you can record this as CPD. Um, as I said, it will be recorded so that when you watch back the session, you can also record that as CPD. So before I hand over to John McGrath, our uh, speaker and presenter for today, I'd like to just go through some housekeeping. So just make sure you can hear and see us and find some of the functionality for Zoom. So use the chat function if you're having any technical difficulties and we'll assist you, or alternatively, you can contact the CPD training inbox or hotline. If you could also rename your profile to your name so that during the Q&A, we can relay your questions to John from the correct name. And then we really encourage your interaction this morning. And John would like you to put the Q&A um, as, as you think of them throughout the session. So you can pop those in the Q&A and we'll come to them at the end. And at the end, you'll be redirected to a, a survey. So we'd really appreciate if you could take that um, as we really appreciate your feedback. So thanks again. I'm going to hand over to John now and really hope you enjoy this webinar this morning. Thank you. OK, guys, so uh, we, we, we'll, we'll make it we'll make a start. Uh, just a question that sometimes asks is the cost of Microsoft projects. I just want to get that out of the way before we actually get into the tool itself. Again, I don't sell Microsoft Project, but it is available where you can buy it as a standard or professional license, or you can also buy an online version as well, and you can host it in the cloud, etc. cetera. Um, so that's the kind of, the, just the, the, the finances out of the way. Um, so just in terms of kind of looking at, uh, where organizations sit. So I think this is very important. Uh, there are kind of different ways we look at project management. There is, there is project management, there is program management, and there's portfolio management. I think Microsoft Project is successful as a project management tool, as a project scheduling tool. And when you go up into program management and portfolio management, it's, it's, it's probably not as effective. And certainly I've seen um, a significant level of where the investment in, in, in the enterprise solution isn't effective. Um, so this is the kind of the, the formal way we look at project management maturity in an organization. Uh, and But probably a more practical way of looking at it is to look at it, and this is how I look at Microsoft Project and how it's used. I talk about rather than the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, it's the good, the bad, and the insane. And that's what I want to show you today. I want to show you all the features that are really good in it, that work well, features that are not so good, and some of the features are that are just simply insane that they aren't turned on or configured correctly. Uh, in terms of my own background, I've been teaching using MS Project for uh, almost 25 years. I've delivered training courses in Project for Engineers for as long. I've also assisted about 250 organizations with different levels of Microsoft Project implementation, whether that be just training on the end user tool or trying to deploy it uh, in very large organizations, including the United Nations and the World Bank, etc. And um, so again, and I think this is very important, I'm going to tell you lots of good things about it and lots of things that are not so good about it. Uh, in terms of looking at this, whether you are a consulting engineer, maybe running your own practice on your own or with one or two people, or whether you're a larger organization who's looking to create that single version of the truth. I think it's very important we understand where project works well and where it does not work so well. So if you think about it, this kind of slide here, this is almost like an individual project. So if that's your kind of business need to plan out in detail a sophisticated critical pack and chart, you know, assign a set of resources, generate a cost report, etc. It does it quite well. So, just my own experience of, and believe it or not, and this is kind of the bad news: two out of three implementations of enterprise project management tools fail. And I think part of that is not recognizing: yes, you have to build capacity at the lower levels, but you also have to build capacity at the higher levels, and you, and you really have to have a project plan in terms of, you know, how you're going to roll out the tool and. Um, the concept of just buying licenses and worrying about the rest afterwards is actually very common. And if you think about it with hindsight, really you should sort of establish some sort of benefit before you get into it. These are the kind of things I would be asking you from a tool that you should be looking at. 
Uh, and you know, this is kind of my checklist. If I'm looking at uh, an enterprise PPM solution, I'm looking at scenario planning, the ability to plan top down, something like a capital works project or something like that, you might be looking at a top down. If I've got multiple projects, I wanna be able to prioritize, look at capacity management of resources across several hundred projects. And you can see the, the other items that are on the list. So, so really we want to try and get all of those items ideally in a project plan tool. Now, this kind of is just a slide that compares one with the other, uh, and it gives you an idea when you look at it, these are all the different things, and you can kind of, this is like a scoring where you can see different capabilities. Okay, so really what I want to do now is I wanna to move to more a hands-on demo that we're gonna roll up our sleeves and look at the tool. Um, so I'm just gonna change, uh, just gonna move this screen over here and just watching the chat, so it's any comments. So I assume everyone can see Microsoft Project on my screen here at the moment. Yes, we can, now, John. Perfect, great. So I've opened, uh, this is Project 2019 Professional. Believe it or not, there is very difference be between the 2010, the 2013, the 2016, and the 2019 version. So it really doesn't matter which version you're going to use here. Rather than opening up an existing uh, large project plan and showing you features, I think it's much easier if I work from literally from zero out of the box. And um, the other thing I would just note to you, I will use quite a different uh, range of buttons in this and they'll be under different tabs. But if you look closely, I have a tab called Engineers Ireland at the top and I've pre-built this and I have all the important buttons in Microsoft Project in this. And I will export this at the end and I can drop it into the Zoom chat or I can pass it on to Elva and she'll email it on to you and you can literally install that into your Microsoft project. So it's the last thing before I do, uh, hopefully Elva, you'll rem remind me if I don't show this at the end, just how to export that tab and how to bring it back into project. So it's kind of a handy thing. I have the top 10 buttons as I would consider here, my resource buttons, my buttons to do with managing a project, et cetera. And I've also duplicated the buttons on the quick access toolbar here. So this is really an instant resource that you can just deploy into any version of project. So don't worry too much about where the buttons are. They are all in that little tab as we progress. Now, most importantly in Microsoft Project, out of the box, its full capabilities are not turned on. In fact, some of the default settings are simply wrong. They haven't been set up correctly. So there's a couple of things here I want to draw to your attention. Down at the bottom, we see manually scheduled at the bottom. That essentially means the project scheduling engine is turned off and you're not getting the capabilities. Essentially, believe it or not, you're using a glorified version of Excel without its scheduling engine running if you're using manually scheduled. There are also a number of issues with the Gantt chart doesn't display the information correctly and also the tasks don't number correctly. So I just wanna enter a couple values here and we'll start to see things working. So I'm gonna put in here phase then I'm going to put in task. I'm just going to put in four tasks, let's say, just drag down like as if I'm in Excel, and I'll put in my milestone then. So that's essentially the concept of how you plan work out. And if you can see here, as I in enter information, it's getting this question mark and this push fin up. So all it takes is one of those to be incorrectly set and your critical path is wrong. You're actually seeing here every single one of them is incorrect. And if you see here, there's no sense of the Gantt chart working or anything like that. Now, if I go in here and I change it to auto scheduled, the software sort of wakes up and you can suddenly see a bar has appeared on the Gantt chart. By default, it is one day question mark. So let's just take a little look here when I go to my first task and the default is day. So if I put in five and I just press enter, it plots it as five days. And you can see the color change in the right here on my Gantt. So you essentially the blue one is good practice. The one underneath the shaded sort of green line is bad practice. That is using manually scheduled. Now I'm just going to enter a few more values and we'll see this working. By the way, you can enter values in multiple ways. I could put in five days or I could put in one W and it plots it as one week. So we can see in the Gantt five days, one week is the same value. I can also plan down to a micro level, such as 15 minutes, and you can barely see that there. Or I could take a macro view and put in 3MO, and now I planned as three months. Uh, the only value I didn't use there is 
is ours. So just to show here, I could go 2H and it puts it in as ours. So those are essentially all the different ways you can enter duration values in project. Now, the key thing here comes back to, on the left of the screen here, we can see that this cursed manual scheduling. Now you can change it here one at a time, which is a bit of a disaster, but much better if you drag down. And as I do so, you see all the activities start to light up in the Gantt. Now, rather than doing that every time, what I would normally do is I would change the global settings to auto scheduled. And that essentially means from the word go, I'm actually using the full scheduling capabilities of project. So we can see at present here, I now have everything set as manually scheduled. And if I enter in another activity, it now, oops, it now picks up manually scheduled again. Now, I'm not gonna do much typing. I'm gonna copy and paste in a moment, but I want less rows on the screen to see functionality rather than more rows in the screen. So just a couple of things here in terms of how I've entered duration. If we look at milestones, so the kind of best practice in project is that you should use milestones at the end of each um, phase. And you just plan a milestone as zero duration, just putting in zero. And as you can see here on the right, it puts in the finish date. Uh, and again, fundamental problems with this, you can see all the work is stacked to start as soon as possible. By the way, very important, unless you set a project start date, which I haven't done yet, project schedules everything as soon as possible, which is today's date, as there is no project start date set. So we can see the idea of it here. Now, even before I start tidying up over here, fundamental sort of issues, let's take a look at the Gantt chart on the right. So if you look at the Gantt chart on the right, it's showing work starting today, and then it shows it working through the weekend and into next week. Now, the Gantt chart is supposed to tell you the project story. It's supposed to simplify it. But even on a very basic data entry like this, it's actually not configured correctly because if we look carefully, the row two task is five days. But if you look, there's one day on Friday and there's four days next week, Monday to Thursday. So we're not actually working the weekend. So one of the fundamental issues with project is non-working time calendaring is behind. It should be in front. So to fix that, I just double click in the timeline here, little uh, calendaring system, double click. And then I go to non-working time and I make it in front of taskbars. And now you see a more accurate and it's showing one day's work, stopping for the weekend, resuming work. So that's kind of the, the visual display just needs a little bit of work as you're seeing here in the right. So that's now I have the duration values now reflecting what is actually shown in the Gantt chart. The other thing about the Gantt chart on the right hand project is if you look at the blue bars, there is no real association with the task names. So this could be an IT project, it could be a road building project. There's no real giveaway here. And really part of, of good scheduling is there's a sort of a brainstorming, a dynamic way you're trying to figure out how to win two weeks back. And my own experience of doing that with engineers is I like to get them kind of standing up in front of Microsoft project, pointing on the screen and telling me, John, move that back, link that, allow a two day lag. And there, it's kind of the idea is, there's a bit of innovation in it. But the problem here is this is just blue bricks, one on top of the other. So the key thing here is you really have to use, pro to use project effectively. You have to get the task names to appear in the Gantt chart. Now, a lot of people say there's no room. There is actually loads of room. If you look to the left of every bar, there's an unlimited amount of room. So in order to get uh, that to appear here, I'm just gonna go to uh, format, and there's another format. And the mistake people often choose is they choose bar. You should be choosing bar styles. The difference is bar is a single row. Bar styles is the global MS project plan. I hit bar styles. And a very kind of busy, confusing window pops up. So just to show you how I get into that again, format tab, format bar styles. And in here, quite a bit here, is I'm gonna go down to text. So I'm actually gonna ignore all this sort of confusing. I go to text and on the left, I just put in N, that's all it takes. Just put in the start of the name field, put in the letter N, press enter. 
And if we take a look, I now have the name of all the activities appearing on the Gantt chart. So obviously in the real world, these will be far more descriptive. I'm using generic names here, but suddenly we have the names appearing. And when I link them, that's gonna be of very significant advantage. Now, the next thing then, is if we kind of take this from a to-do list to an actual project phase. So the key sort of rule and project is when you're working into the Gantt, you select down, including the milestone, and you never select the phase heading. So you will rarely ever click on a phase heading and project. Everything is driven bottom up. So I select from the first activity down to the milestone and the two key buttons to, to transition this from a to-do list to really a calculated phase is I just go up here to task. And there's two key buttons here. All of these buttons again are on that Engineers Ireland tab. I have my link and I have my indent. And as you can see, it pushes out and it creates a finish to start relationship between my activities. So let's just take a look at that. I'll undo that. Control Z. There's a flat uh, Gantt chart selecting from the first activity down to the milestone, up to the chain link. And as I click on that, let's look at the Gantt chart. Everything shoots out to a default finish to start relationship. And as I hit the green arrow, it's gonna tell all the tasks under phase that they are belonging to the item above it. You'll notice I never put a duration in of one day. That's just a default value. But when I hit the increase indent, green arrow to the right, hey presto, project calculates bottom up and it's now got a summary of everything uh, below it. So this is a calculated value. Now I'm just going to change that three months to two days and I'm just going to fill out this Gantt chart now reasonably quickly here. So the first thing I'm going to do here guys is a quick way if you're you know if you're doing something like an office fit out and you might do similar work ground floor and, and, their, and the top floor are often different but if you're planning something like you know a six-story building fit out uh, floor two, three, four, five, or something is usually quite similar. Very handy little trick. You can just close down the phase, click in the row number, control C, and I'm going to control V three more times one, two, three. And now I've got four phases in Emma's project, and we can see the four of them running in parallel. We will see that the names are on every single activity. So at the moment, we're running here four phases in parallel. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build links between the phases. Now, if you pick up a lot of official curriculums in Microsoft Project, they will tell you you link phases in this technique. So you click link from the phase to the phase and you hit the chain link button. The problem with doing that is it creates very long, complex lines for you to follow on the Gantt chart. So if you can see the idea here, the black line goes down. Now I have only four or five lines, but in reality, I could have a hundred lines. So that black line disappears down to the abyss. And when you're down at the phase it links to, all you see is a blank line shooting far up into the schedule. So best practice is actually not to do that, believe it or not, but much smarter technique. When you want to link your phases together, you select from the milestone above, hold down control, and you select the first activity below. So we never select phase headings. We hit the link button. And if you look now, you've got the same impact here, but a much cleaner, smarter line to follow. You gotta remember guys, if you build a messy Gantt chart in the planning stage, when you load all the information into it, the actual, and you start comparing plan versus actual, it gets very messy. So you want a clean, logical, easy to follow Gantt to begin with. Now I'm gonna try and simulate a real project where I have that sort of bell curve of work, I'm gonna have phase one starting and then phase two and three will run in parallel. So I'm gonna link again from the milestone of phase one to the first activity in phase three. And as I hit the chain link, we can now see, if we take a little look here, that the two phases are running in parallel. But obviously the problem here is phase four hasn't linked in yet. So I'm gonna link phase four to start. Actually, there's my own little buttons here just grabbing them, but there's the standard one. And I'm going to link it. And I also need to link it here to phase two to phase four. And I've now built a sort of dynamic critical path. I'm just going to change one of the values in this in phase two and three. Now, this concept here where I've actually built something like this, we're now going to take a look here and we're going to try and see, can we figure out the critical path? 
Now, this is a reasonably easy to, to analyze schedule. So if I actually look at it, I can kind of see here that there's an element of floater slack, as we call it, from this milestone pushing down. So that's actually the critical path phase one, two, and four. But you don't even need to be able to read it because project will find it for you. So I go to format. I simply put a little tick into critical tasks. And hey, presto, there is the critical path plotted in Microsoft Project. That's how easy it is to do. So you can see the idea. And obviously, the critical path is dynamic. If there was a delay in phase two, let's make this 20 days here, the critical path has now changed. And we can see uh, phase three is now non-critical. Now, very important, I've deliberately let this happen. I keep talking about phase one, two, three, and four. And if you look here, the names are generic. There is no unique numbering system in project out of the box. So that's really difficult. When somebody talks about, you know, fit out of, uh, you know, a, 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 a fit plasterboard, uh, and that's in six different places in your project schedule, nobody knows what you're talking about. So one of the principles is you should have a WBS identifier for each activity in project. Now it is there, but it's not turned on. And these are kind of what are, when I talk about the insane in Microsoft Project, this is the type of stuff I'm talking about, not putting the names on the Gantt chart, not turning on the unique numbering field. So let's take a look at how we do that. I just go to format and over here, there's a feature for outline number. So just under the format tab, and let's have a look what happens to the left of all the names as I press it. Hey, presto, I have a unique numbering system coming up for each activity. So instead of talking about, you know, task 11, I can now talk about 2.4. And most people would know their schedule. Well, phase two, item number four, you'd have a reasonable idea what it is. The other slightly crazy thing about this is they never turned on the project role by default. If you look at this, I have a heading for every phase, but there's no heading for the project. So if you look here, row one, there is a row zero in project, but you have to know to turn that on. So I have to go back up again, format, and turn on project summary task. And now row zero appears, and it gives a sort of a rolled up summary of everything in the project. So you're actually seeing, and, and I really have a love-hate relationship with Microsoft Project. I love it when it works well, but I hate the fact they haven't got it configured correctly. But really what you're finding, guys, is you can't use MS Project and a default schedule out of the box. All these things, the naming is missing, et cetera. In fact, if we look here, we have a unique number on the entry, the left section, the bit that looks a bit like Excel, but we don't have a unique numbering showing on the right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to put that in. Again, people say there's no room. There's loads of room. I can put it into the task bar. So how I do that, format, format bar styles, same as before. In I go to inside and I just press W and I find the WBS field. And hey presto, I now have a unique identifier. I'm just gonna turn this off for a sec so we can see it a bit better. Just keep that. And you can see now I have a unique identifier in each item and you can see the numbering coming up 4.1, 4.2 matching over here. Also, the grid lines are missing from the Gantt. They should be, they're there, but they're not turned on. So I'm going to go to grid lines, grid lines. And everyone turns on the first one because that's what's there. That's the worst one to use. It makes the whole schedule very cluttered. You can see lots of heavy black lines. The correct grid line to use is the second last one, the little dotted line. It's a far more subtle line. And as you can see, it's not intrusive in my project schedule. So that's kind of almost kind of the, the basic substance on how you build a Gantt. Now here's very interesting, look at this. I'm scrolling in project. You don't have to scroll. In fact, you never should scroll. Let's take a look at a better way of doing this. So scrolling, imagine a two year project and you're in a meeting, you could be waiting three minutes to get over to the right. So again, my project is pretty simple, 24 rows and it goes out to the right finish date there going into the end of January, as we can see. Now, I want to show you a very effective technique when you want to navigate in project. Now, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to decide I want to see 4.3. I want to get a look at that row on my Gantt chart. So what I'm going to do here, very clever little button, scroll to task. 
you don't have to scroll over you just go down to the row you want up i go and i hit scroll to task and it brings it into view so very typically in a project meeting people come in with queries on the schedule right john jump back up to row four i have a question for you there so same idea i hit four scroll to task and it shoots me back up so that's the scroll to task feature absolutely crucial uh, and really useful but a lot of people don't notice it uh, and if you can see here, it is one of my buttons in the tab that I've pre-built for us. Now, even better than scroll to task, there is the idea that you can on a large schedule, you can go down to a point in time and out to the right. So almost like a X and Y analysis. So rather than me even having to go down to row, if you could imagine row number 700 and out 18 months into my project. So much smarter than that, if you can imagine that we're in a meeting and I'm looking for updates from you guys and somebody says, right, John, go down to row 240, I have a change to make there. Well, super way of doing it, control and G, the go to function. And you type in the ID number, I just use 20 here for demonstration. And as quick as I can type it, I'm down to row 20 and the Gantt chart comes in to meet me. So that's control and G, super useful shortcut and project, up to two, back up and out, and the Gantt chart comes to meet me. If you don't like using shortcuts, by the way, control G, there is a function key that will do this. I hit F5 and it also brings up the go to. You can also drive the go to function by date. So I want to look at what's scheduled for the first week in January in the project. I hit OK and it shoots me over there. So quite, quite useful techniques, especially if you have a large schedule. Again, I've limited myself to 24 rows, so I'm not scrolling all the time here. Just otherwise it's too hard to watch in a, in a webinar. But you can see the idea, some very good functionality in it. Really, if you think about it, those buttons should be absolutely core. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's what I've tried to do here. I have my own tab when I use project. I just can be that little bit quicker about it. Okay, wanna just take a look at the link types because this caused a lot of confusion in project. Just watching the clock here, plenty to cover in the time. Just a small thing here. I wanna put in two real activities instead of tasks. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to imagine that I have two activities, which are going to be, um, uh, I'm going to go with um, hang pictures and paint walls. Now, I'm going to sl uh, slow things down just a little bit here, just so we can take a look at this. So this is kind of, now a lot of the issues around kind of scheduling claims uh, and disputes on, on schedule and critical path comes down to how we link activities together. So I'm just gonna set this up in a nice little simple way here so we can see it. It'll do, and I'll make both my activities five days. And if we take a little look, we should see two five day activities. I'm actually even gonna set my project to a start date of a Monday to make it easier. So if you wanna set the project start date, um, in this case here, what I'm going to do now is I go to project, project information, and I can just hit the drop down and I can set the start date. Let's take a look at that again. Project tab, project information, and I can set the start date. I'm actually going to set it in the past as if we're a live in a project. So I'm going to set it back there onto Monday, the 12th of October. I hit OK. Very interesting. There's today. It's picking up in the project where I am as of today. Now, let's take a little look at these two activities here with the, with the five days in them. And I'm gonna link them together in a default finish to start relationship. So I just hit my little chain link and you can see them there. Now, the first thing is logic would suggest you might be better off, John, hanging, painting the walls before you hang the pictures. So this link is kind of wrong or my activities are in the wrong order. Now, when I double click in the link line, there is four different ways of linking and one of them is called start to finish. Now I'm just forcing this to be used here. I want you to essentially see you don't need to use this. So if I go to start to finish, uh, give me a little warning. Now it has simulated them. The paint walls is now in front of hanging the pictures, but really that is sort of bad layout. I'm going to delete the link. Really what's wrong is I just have my activities in the wrong order. So if I actually just drag down, I can swap the order. Now I've got paint walls, hang pictures, and I select the two of them and I link, and we can see the idea. Now, 
if there is some sort of kind of delay where I need to put in what we call a lag in scheduling, a wait time. So I'm going to imagine I have to allow an extra week for the, for the walls to dry. You don't change the duration from five to 10. That's incorrect. You put in a lag by double clicking on the link line, increasing the lag to five days. And you now see the idea I've put in a lag time on the schedule. If I want to fast track the project, I would put in negative lag. So I'm now going to go minus two. And we can now see the idea that there's overlap between the activities, but it is maintaining the relationship between paint walls and hang pictures. Now, other ways of linking, if you could imagine there's, let's imagine there's five rooms to be painted and it's going to take a day to paint each room and a day to hang the pictures. Well, I'm allowing 10 days, but common sense would suggest it could be done in six. You could start hanging the pictures in room one on the second day. You could work a day behind. If you want to simulate that in a project, I could set it for a finish to start, but a minus four lag. And in this case here, it now plots it. And you can see painting walls is happening, but hanging. The, so there are lots of ways how you can build in those links. Probably a little bit too technical to get into here in the time we have, but I would say that one of the kind of the clever advantages in, in, in scheduling, and unfortunately, ver very few organizations do this, but you can actually change those links to sort of exploit delays and to exploit claims or to defend claims. You can almost kind of build sort of um, what if analysis that would suit you if somebody's going back to look at a critical path delay and the consequences, you can actually by using the links correctly in project, you can sort of create an advantage in a future dispute scenario in Microsoft Project. There are lots of global organizations, consulting firms who earn a living uh, by getting people in and out of, of schedule disputes, but you can actually build it into your schedule. Okay, now, so just again, watching the clock, and we can see here, I spent quite a bit of time in the Gantt chart, and the reason being, it's absolutely fundamental. If you haven't got the Gantt chart right, nothing works in Project. But if you have the Gantt chart right, you can then move to your resource sheet, which is this little icon here. I click in the resource sheet just down here at the bottom. And if we see here, I can put in a resource sheet. I can put in here people or material. So I'm gonna just keep this pretty simple here. And I'm gonna put in Tom, Sue, Pat, and Anne. I have four resources. And if we look at standard rates over here, I can put in cost rates for them. I'm going to keep the, the resource rates really simple just to keep the maths easy. So I'm going to bill Tom at 10 euros an hour to the project, which if you were to roll that up is 80 euros a day is 400 euros a week. So on the basis that there's eight working hours in the day, which the project works from, I'm going to take a different view with Sue. I'm going to bill Sue at 52,000 a year to the project, 52,000 forward slash Y. And now it bills Sue, and the reason I picked that figure, it's an easy one, a thousand a week, 200 a day, if you kind of work in a, a top-down estimate. Pat here, I'm gonna put in as 100 forward slash D, I'm billing Pat in the daily rate. And then I'm gonna make a classic mistake, I'm gonna put in four uh, 4,000 forward slash, and I'm meaning M for month, but I should have used MO. And Anne accidentally has gone in as 400 euros a minute. Nice work if you can get it. Now, I'm going to deliberately leave that mistake there because it's going to come back and haunt me in a little while. Now, underneath this, I'm going to put in concrete. And this time I'm going to mark that as a material. Now, what I like about this is you can, you can put in a kind of a label. Uh, and so I'm just going to put in M3 as a cube. And I'm going to put in 100. And that's my rate. And I'm going to put in here steel. And that's going to be a material as well. And I'm going to put in a, a LM for linear meter or tone or whatever it is. But the idea is in description, you can add a bit more. If you notice here, I actually have my resources in as, as, as numbers. And the reason being, in a lot of projects I work on, which are infrastructure, we talk about I need two, I need two uh, machines. We don't talk about 200%. The default in project is to call your resources percent. I think it's real messy in the reports, et cetera. So you can change that to decimals like I have by going file, options, 
uh, display, sorry, excuse me, schedule actually, and there it is, show assignment unit. So the default is percentage, decimal is the better one. So decimal is what we tend to use in, in uh, uh, civils, uh, engineering, construction type projects. I've never heard somebody say, I need 500% of uh, general operatives next week. We'd say, I need five general operatives. We don't talk about uh, people or machines in the decimalization. Uh, and very few industries do, to be honest. Okay, so we can see the idea. I just wanna show one little, very clever little tool I like in this. I'm gonna simulate there's a cost increase of four and a half percent from the second week in January, and I need this built into my project. So what I'm actually gonna do here is I'm gonna double click on concrete and I'm gonna go into costs and there's the standard rate. But there is a price increase coming. So I'm gonna notify it into the schedule. I want this costed into it. And from Monday 11th of January, it's gonna go up by four and a half percent. I don't even have to calculate it. I just type in plus 4.5%. And you can see now the new rate from the 11th to the 1st is 104.50. So it's kind of quite clever in those type of things. We hit OK. And now I've built in a couple of resources. I go back to the Gantt. And this is kind of the magic moment because really a schedule on its own is pretty useless. By the way, great little check if you just get a look at a Gantt chart and it comes into you and you want to see what level of work they've done. If I go to project, project information, and I hit that stats button. That is the button to tell you everything in project. And I can see here, they're starting on this date, they're finishing on this date. And I can see they have no work, they haven't assigned any resources and they've no cost built into it either. Now I'm gonna, that's gonna change dramatically when I start adding my resources. So let's have a little look how we do that. Resource tab, assign resources. That's the key button here. So I hit assign resources and I'm now gonna select Anne. And I'm just going to sign Anne. If we have a little look, as I assign Anne to the activity, her name appears to the right. And you can see it also appearing in the resource name column as well. Now let's take a look at task two. Um, I'm going to assign Pat to this, but I'm also going to assign uh, some steel and some concrete. I want us to take a look at how this works. So you can see Pat's gone in there with one de by default, one linear meter and one cube of concrete. But I'm going to change that. I'm just going to put in here 30 for the uh, steel and for the concrete, I'm going to put in 50. And I like that because it actually puts it into the Gantt chart. You can see the resource and the materials that are used. I could do that the whole way down. I don't think there's any benefit in doing this. Uh, but just a quick look, project, project information, stats. And now we're starting to see it working as a planning tool. It's now after picking up, there's a loading of 80 hours against this project so far at a cost of 965,000. So um, I think, uh, let me have a look, is that, yeah, so that's the problem. Anne is, Anne is an expensive resource. So you can see my cost is shooting up here because of Anne at that four grand a minute. Again, if I was to change this on the fly and fix that problem here, and change on from minute to month, MO, I should get a more manageable cost. And if we look here now, project information, stats, and we can see now the cost has gone down to 5,600. So it's quite dynamic in how it plans it. Now, I'm gonna load in a few resources into this very quickly, just so I can run a few reports, et cetera. So I'm gonna select these three, resource, assign resources. I'm gonna give that to Sue. I'm gonna give all of these to Pat and Tom. And I'm gonna select a couple here. Uh, and I'm gonna give, so I'm just assigning a few resources as we go. I have a few activities not assigned, which is fine. And I basically assigned very quickly there. And if we take a look, you can see the names appearing against all the different activities. Now, I'm gonna take a quick look at the reports here. If I I can see visually the loading of the work. So I can see uh, so far just in my rough and ready assignments that the bulk of the work is being loaded into Pat and Tom. And in these case, these two resources aren't assigned yet. I can also see nobody's actually done any work yet. There's no work being done. There's a whole range of visual reports in that. They do look great out of the box and everyone thinks, wow, I have to say in the real world, it's not too long before you realize that you're gonna have to customize them and build custom reports. Now, 
So the next thing then, just to take a quick look, setting the baseline, the absolutely crucial thing in project, locking in the baseline. Just very quickly here, project, set baseline, set baseline. So once I set the baseline, I now have a set of plan values and I'm gonna have a set of actual values to track against as well. So if I hit set baseline, I hit okay. While nothing changes on screen, project to, to, be, to be compared against. Now this is the most significant thing you can do in a project schedule is to lock in the baseline, but there's no visual uh, indicator to say the baseline is locked in. Now, if you want to double check, is the baseline definitely locked? A couple of ways you can do it. Project information stats. If you see baseline has dates in it, that indicates it's been locked. If it has NA, there's no baseline set. Now, how most people update Microsoft Project, which simply does not work, is they select an activity and they go in and they click the percent buttons. And that does give you a superficial sort of update to say it's done. But what it does not do is track delays. It does not track that. It, all it does is a tick box to say it's done or it's not done. The real important button in project is hidden under mark and track. And there is the key button, update tasks. I click in here and I can now simulate reality. This activity was due to start on the 26th to the 10th. It was a delay. It didn't start until I'm going to say the Wednesday. So there's a delay starting it, can eight hours to do. Now it is finished, so I dropped the remaining. So there's me tracking variance. I hit OK. And you can see the GAN chart jumped a little bit. And now if I go back up and check project information stats, I'm now seeing that there's a variance between the baseline cost and the actual cost. And I'm also looking at it coming in late as well. I can see I'm going to have a finished variance. So that's kind of the, and the last thing then if I was to just run it, have a quick look at my reports again, I'm just watching the clock here, gonna take a look at your questions, resources, resource overview. And now I'm starting to see that people are burning through the work or getting things done. So that's kind of an A to Z really in how to set projects. So how to use projects. So if you look, we kind of really put together a, a critical path. Uh, we loaded on our resources. With that came the costs as well. Then I set the baseline and then I updated the actual against the plan and I'm running a set of reports as we go along. So, um, oh yes, the, I, I, I just have a quick look for questions. Uh, uh, maybe Elva, and then I, before I export the, uh, the tab out of this. You, you there, 